Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this much anticipated special edition of our Lamposium in Your Living Room series. My name is Charlene Dunn. I am the Patient and Clinical Programs Director for the LAM Foundation, and it is my sincere pleasure and honor to welcome you to this evening's presentation. We will begin with a tribute to our fabulous and now emeritus scientific director, Dr. Frank McCormick, followed by a conversation with the scientific panel that, had we been at Lamposium, would have drawn a standing room only crowd. Our panelists will share insights regarding their enthusiasm for and the future of LAM science. Part of that conversation will include their responses to a variety of questions submitted in advance by patients and other members of our LAM community. We will conclude the evening with closing remarks from each of our guests. And now for the tribute. In any other time, we would have recognized and honored this momentous transition while gathered at Lamposium with as many of us together as could make it to Cincinnati. In any other time, toasts and hugs and applause would have been a huge part of the evening. It was in this spirit and with gratitude filled hearts that our LAM community came together to create for Dr. McCormick a video tribute celebrating his 25 years of leadership and his transition from scientific director to emeritus scientific director. But before we hit play on our tribute video, I would like to offer a heartfelt thank you to Dana and Dave Garrett from Trailhead Films for their outstanding work in producing this beautiful piece. We hope you enjoy it. I first met Frank at a Lamposium in Cincinnati in 2000. In 2005, when we attended our first Lamposium. In 2008, shortly after I was diagnosed. Shortly after I was diagnosed in 2014. In 2016, when our daughter was diagnosed with LAM. I was Googling LAM specialists, and lo and behold, up pops a picture of Frank. And the first thing I noticed about him were his kind, kind eyes, and that cinched it for me. I was amazed at how approachable he was to me and anyone else that wanted or needed to talk with him. I first met Frank in the early days of the foundation. He came to Cincinnati in 1995 to be the director of pulmonology at the University of Cincinnati Medical School. There was no research being done on LAM in those days, nor was it part of his new job. But on his first day in the office, there was one and only one letter on his desk. Guess who it was from? Sue Burns. Sue had heard that an excellent young doctor was coming to Cincinnati and that he was, quote, the most honorable man you'll ever meet. It didn't take long for Sue to convince Frank that lymphangiolyomatosis was something he might want to look at. LAM is a disease that has a lot of natural clues, and I was optimistic that there could be progress in this disease. That was one factor. Another factor was Sue Burns was so persistent. Uh, she called frequently and really drove this process forward just by the, her will. Frank agreed to work with us because he was interested and because he cared. When Sue Burns asked me to help, I didn't have much to offer in terms of therapies or management options, but we together decided to start a foundation to try to raise money and uh, get research going in this disease. My lamb sisters and I have been blessed over the years by Frank's hunger for answers. He has worked for us for 25 years for no money, no salary, not even a discount on lambware. He has worked for us out of his hunger for answers and out of his caring heart. He was and is a great scientist who joined our cause and made the accomplishment of our mission a possibility. We now have an effective suppressive therapy. When I think about what Frank McCormick means to the LAM Foundation, I think of the lungs and the heart. 
On one level, they're distinctly different organs, yet they're completely interdependent, and each is vital to the success of the other. The Lamb Foundation and Frank McCormick have been symbiotic in the best possible ways for more than a quarter century. Frank has been the spearhead of the Lamb Foundation clinical science for the whole 25 years of the Lamb Foundation existence. Frank has made an absolutely huge difference in the understanding of Lamb and in the care of Lamb patients. Frank is a great scientist because he chooses the right questions. Everything starts with the key question of how can we help the patients? How will this translate into patient benefit? And I think that is the primary reason why the LAM field and the patient community has had so many discoveries because everything is being led by that central question and that central theme in mind. From the beginning, he had the foresight to know that in order to make progress to understand this disease, the patients had to be organized and funds needed to be raised to fund LAM research. Having been integral to the foundation for the first 10 years, meant that as the science was starting to come together and reveal a pathway, he recognized and understood the importance of the moment. He saw that Sue Burns had organized and assembled the patients so that clinical trials could be started, and he initiated the MILES trial. The MILES trial was only maybe the third or fourth clinical trial in this rare disease. As of today, there are currently 41 studies in LAM that have been completed or are ongoing. That's quite a track record. The FDA approval of sirolimus for the treatment of LAM is the single most important accomplishment of this foundation, and that simply would not have happened without Frank McCormick as our leader. One of Frank's greatest contributions to the field, I think, is really the ability to study rare lung diseases, take those findings from those and apply them to, you know, more common lung disease. He uses his uh, knowledge and vision to build the science that has led uh, to really great discoveries. One of the most remarkable things that's, that has come out of the study of LAM is that it's really rewriting biochemistry textbooks. The other major accomplishment that Frank led uh, was the development of VEGFD as a blood-based biomarker that has subsequently saved countless LAM women from needing uh, invasive procedures uh, to get a confirmed diagnosis. VEGFD, that was just supposed to be a, a small side project. And last but not the least, it's been the establishment of the LAM clinic network, which has provided an ease of access for the LAM patients to be able to get high quality and expert clinical care, and also act as a collaborative network of sites where uh, we can conduct uh, multiple research uh, endeavors. So I start my talk with a typo in the first line. Whenever Dr. McCormick was giving a presentation, we knew he was going to throw in some dry humor or a funny slide, poking fun at a colleague or even himself. So in conclusion then, the cleavers are getting older. These are uh, Eddie, the Beave, Wally, and Lumpy. Joel is getting older and more serene. <laughs> in Japan, you, this is what you call a fish, and in the United States, this is what we call a fish. I got a lesson in resilience and courage and joie de vivre, and I learned how to say that word today. <laughs> and this is the title I'm going with, which is uh, 20 years of land moments that amaze me, move me, and crack maybe only me up. Frank taught me that there's a good movie quote for almost every situation, including that there's no crying in baseball. No crying in baseball manner that Bev tells But most importantly, Frank taught me how to ensure that we put patients first, how to pursue science that matters, and how to build collaborations and partnerships to achieve goals. Dr. McCormick inspired a whole generation of scientists and clinical researchers to keep fighting for an answer for women with LAM everywhere. Frank was and is a great mentor. Hey, Chris. How are you, Dr. McCormick? Good. He's always there to answer questions. He's always there to give guidance, uh, career guidance, or guidance around patient care. He was kind enough to take me on as a young pup in a, a research position in his lab, and he taught me that, you know, 
Honesty and integrity are everything. Working with Frank has created a path for me, which has brought inspiration and meaning in ways that I never imagined. Working with Frank has has been a just a source of immense joy and immense um, inspiration over the years. The things that I have learned from Frank that I will emulate are uh, his humility and the principle of servant leadership, uh, as well as uh, generosity with uh, both time and credit. I will always remember when Frank told us about serolimus possibly being a treatment for lamb. I was so happy and excited, I cried. Tears of joy. I will always remember Dr. McCormick doing a phone call with my family and I just to reassure us that everything was going to be okay when I was first diagnosed. In the first year of the MILES trial, I ended up being in the emergency room. Later, when I was talking to Dr. McCormick about this experience, he said he would understand if I dropped out of the trial. It showed that he really cared about me as a person, as a lamb patient, and that I was more important than his research. He really does care about the women that suffer from this disease, and he has dedicated his life to making their lives better. Many of us have a t-shirt that made the rounds some years ago. It says, Frank knows lamb, and I know Frank. That says it all, really. I'm gonna cry, Dr. McCormick. I'll start up. Dr. McCormick has always been there for lambies, for our lamb physicians, for our scientists. Frank has made things happen. He has inspired other pulmonologists to study lamb and see patients in their clinical practices. He helped create an international network of lamb clinics. Dr. McCormick has been a bright beacon of hope. A source of hope and guidance for me and the lamb community. Dr. McCormick's dedication to the science of lamb has resulted in prolonged life for hundreds of women and hope not only for those with lamb, but for their families and loved ones as well. I'm very grateful for having had meaningful work for all these years through LAM, and it's been one of the great joys of my life. All organizations have founders, and some organizations have founders who become leaders over time. It's extremely rare to find a founder and a leader who contributes such passion and curiosity for more than 25 years. And it's that time that's absolutely priceless. Frank, Thank you. Thank you for the tens of thousands of hours that you have spent learning, teaching, presenting, studying, writing, editing, advocating, diagnosing, treating, listening, caring, sharing, and laughing with this community. Those hours have saved and improved countless lives. And for that, we owe you a debt of gratitude that's impossible to calculate. Frank, what you've meant to the LAMB community is unbelievable. You've been with us the whole way and you put up with us for a good long time. Thank you. Thank you for caring enough to listen to Sue Burns 25 years ago and for giving me and all LAMBies hope. We are forever grateful. Thank you, Frank, for showing the world that high-quality rare disease research can be done when you find the right molecular target and engage the rare disease population the way that you have. Thank you, Dr. McCormick, for ch choosing to face the challenge of a rare, unknown disease and for fighting for so many years. I'd like to thank uh, Frank again for all of his contributions to LAM science and clinical care and I will remember those forever. I wanted to thank you for your selflessness and your empathy. I would not be here today if it wasn't for you. You have supported me with my research endeavors, with my clinical endeavors, and also with my American citizenship application. So I definitely wouldn't physically be here today um, unless it were for you. Thank you, Frank, for everything you've done for all of us. Thank you, Dr. McCormick, for your kindness, your time, your devotion, your brains, your care, 
and your gentle spirit in caring for us Lammies. You will be very missed. Perhaps in a world of over seven billion people, someone would have stepped up to do this work if you had not. But you did step up, and we are grateful for who you are and for what you have done on behalf of the Lamb community. On behalf of our Lambre, the Brazilian Infanjuleio Maiomatosis Association, I would like to thank you, Dr. Frank McCormack, for everything you have done for Lamb patients and their families all over the world. Without your dedication, your expertise, and your team spirit, we wouldn't be at this stage of LAM diagnosis, treatment, and research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCormick, for being a role model for what I would say all diseases. Having developed a foundation and doing the translation from science to the patient to the practical management of a disease. For that, for the whole community should be forever grateful. Thank you, Frank, for your generosity, your leadership, and for your humanity. Thank you for giving us all hope. I'm so thrilled to see that you get a chance to take a deep breath and step back. And I couldn't be more proud of you for stepping back so that someone else can step forward. Arahanui. Frank, which in the Maori New Zealand native language means much love and much happiness in the future. Thank you, Frank, for uh, bringing me in this field, for teaching me all that I know, not only about the science, but also about your guiding philosophies in life. Uh, for never once saying this was a dumb idea to my random ramblings, uh, for your mentorship, uh, for your friendship, uh, and for all the memories and conversations over the years uh, that hold a special place in my heart and uh, I, will leave, I will selfishly keep them to myself. Frank, you have been a rock. Saying thank you seems so little, but you know what being a scientist and physician can mean. That's what you are to me and to thousands of lamb patients and those who love them. Wow, um, you know, I've watched that so many times and still um, moved by uh, a powerful and uh, just beautifully put together video. Um, and other than that, what do you say when you're the one slated to follow that video? <laughs> um, well, if you've thought it through, you promptly bring on the only person who can follow the video, the man himself. And it is my pleasure now to turn the mic over to the one and only Dr. Frank McCormick. Thank you, Shar. That was overwhelming. I uh, I don't know what to say. Um, it's completely unexpected. I, I did hear this was coming, uh, but I, I had no idea uh, what a wonderful tribute uh, you've put together. And uh, I wanna thank everyone who had anything to do with commissioning this video and putting it together. Uh, the Garretts, Sue Sherman, and uh, Shar and everyone who worked on it. Um, it's the only way you usually get to hear these kinds of things said about you is if you're dying or dead or retiring. And I don't intend to do any of those things. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going anywhere. I tend to be fully involved with the LAM Scientific Advisory Board and with LAM science, seeing LAM patients doing LAM trials. Uh, I just think it's time for some new ideas and energy. Um, and succession planning is so important for a small organization like this. It's, it's, you know, I was so fortunate to have run across Nishant, who, uh, you know, is, is the only person that I can think of over the last 20 years who has every single quality that I think is, is a perfect fit for this uh, foundation. I've, I've had many great um, mentees who are wonderful scientists, but uh, the combination of his humility and his uh, 
kindness and his knowledge of science and of lamb and, and all the effort he's put into lamb, his ability to must multitask uh, in an absolutely phenomenal way and to do everything in a very high quality manner is just unparalleled. So I think the foundation's in for some, some great years uh, in, with his leadership going forward. You know, I, I'm grateful for, I, I think everything was said in that video, I'm so grateful for having been part of this community and uh, I've gotten so much from it um, that it's, you know, I don't need any thanks. It's, it's, been a, it's been, as I said in the video, one of the great joys of my life. Uh, you know, I've been all over the world and with, with my wife talking about Lamb. Uh, I've learned so much from patience about courage and resilience and Judah Vive, which I'm getting very good at now. Um, met some amazing women and families. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of introducing many investigators to Lamb, and it's an easy sell because it's so fascinating. There's so many clues. There, there are a few diseases like it in pulmonary medicine where uh, you know, the, the prospect of making progress uh, is, is so apparent. And, uh, you know, I think the, the fact that we are where we are is a, is a combination of uh, the inspiration that we've all derived from interacting with patients at the LAM conference every year and interacting uh, with patients on the phone. Uh, we, we learn so much from your phone calls when you tell us about the issues that have come up in your lives and that makes us into experts and we can um, convey that to others and distribute this expertise around the globe instead of instead of hoarding it, which happens in so many other diseases. Uh, someone becomes an expert in a disease and wants all patients to come to them. But it, it makes so much more sense to get people engaged all over the globe and work on this problem together. Um, and I think that's been one of the reasons why we've made progress so quickly. Another thing I'm grateful for is just the fantastic uh, people I've had the pleasure of mentoring, Lisa Young, Nishant Gupta, Jim Bridges, and, and many others. It's, it's, that's one of the great pleasures of this work is, is seeing young people uh, who go on to become leaders of the future and who are, uh, you know, make, make the next uh, group of discoveries. I, you know, I want to thank my wife because uh, She's put up with a lot of uh, distracted attention from me. Uh, we, <laughs> we moved here uh, to this place, this house, um, what, 27 years ago, 26 years ago. We had five children, all uh, eight, eight uh, years of age and under, including a newborn. And uh, I usually get home at seven and I go to my computer and she cooks us all dinner and then I go back to my computer and she's, uh, she's carried a lot of the water around here for a very long time and I'm looking forward to having more time to spend with her. We're on a new uh, kick of trying to take a walk every evening together. We're on night three if we, if we do it tonight. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I hope that by simplifying my life a little bit, I get to give a little back to her. Um, and my grandchildren, that we have four grandchildren uh, just uh, 25 minutes from here and I've had to miss um, some events with them and I, I'd like to see more of their growing up uh, than I have been seeing uh, going forward. Um, so I just want to reiterate that I'm not, I'm not leaving, I'm not retiring, I'm not, I'm not uh, going to be any less interested and engaged with Lamb, except that I'm going to let Nishant do a lot of the work, <laughs> and uh, he's he's uh, he's he's going to amaze all of you. I promise you. And thank you again for putting this wonderful tribute together. Thank you, Frank, um, and thank you, Holly, uh, for being with us tonight and um, for all of the support throughout the, the many years. Um, and now we'll move forward. It is, is my pleasure to introduce, um, who Frank has already introduced so lovely, um, our newly named scientific director, someone whose name is quite familiar within our community, as we know, and who, like his mentor, is moving us forward with his compassion, his humility, his intelligence, and his always appreciated and delightful sense of humor, Dr. Nishant Gupta. 
Nishant, thank you for being with us this evening. I'll turn this over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Char. Uh, wow, what a, what a fantastic tribute uh, uh, that was. I'm a little bit speechless, but uh, I think I'll echo what, what has already been said about Frank, that I think the entire uh, LAM community, the scientists, the clinicians, the patients, Frank, uh, all of the entire community owes a large part of their success to you. Uh, we wouldn't be in this position that we are now uh, if it was not for your vision, your leadership, uh, your hard work, uh, your never say quit attitude. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, uh, even what you said, it, 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 it's, such, it's so emblematic of uh, Frank McCormack that even on the, um, on his tribute, you uh, uh, were uh, uh, spending uh, parts of it uh, to bring me up. And, and that's just, uh, that just says all, all about you. Um, also wanted to point out in case you're not watching the chat, Holly, there are some suggestions for you to make Frank do all the housework now. <laughs> Just, I love it. Um, uh, uh, on that note, I'll also uh, share a personal anecdote that Frank and I have uh, occasionally talked about, but the community doesn't uh, know is um, one of my first memories with Frank is um, uh, rounding with him as a uh, first year fellow in pulmonary medicine. Uh, and Frank uh, posed a question, uh, the answer to which was a, a rare lung disease. And uh, I must admit that I had to uh, seek the expert help of Dr. Google to get to the right answer. Um, and although that was the first, it certainly wasn't the last time that I had to Google something that Frank said, uh, whether it was something pertaining to rare lung diseases uh, or something that Frank said about uh, an American slang or a Hollywood reference more often than not. Uh, on a more serious note, I think I'll, I've said this before, I'll say it again, Frank, that you're the reason I'm in this field and all that I know um, is stuff that you've taught me. And so, so thank you for all that you do and, and for being a constant source of inspiration. Um, you know, this is also the one instance where I think the virtual format doesn't do any justice. I wish there was a way to give a standing ovation on Zoom. Uh, and it seems a bit odd, but I've also been tasked to move on to the next part of the agenda. Um, uh, so as part of that, I'm, I'm going to introduce our uh, panelists and our moderator for the evening. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep the intros very brief. All, all three folks here really don't need any introduction. Uh, uh, first up is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hensky or Lisa Hensky. Uh, Lisa is the director of the Center of LAM Research and Clinical Care at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, Lisa has uh, lab discovered that LAM is caused by mutations in the tuberous sclerosis complex genes. Uh, next up is uh, Dr. Vida Krimskaya. She is a professor of medicine uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, Vida uh, discovered that uh, TSC2 uh, mutations uh, lead to a negative regulation of the mTOR pathway. And together, both Lisa and Vera have been at the forefront of groundbreaking LAM research uh, and are responsible for numerous advancements in our understanding of the disease. Uh, and finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, who again doesn't need any introduction. It's Sue Sherman. Uh, Sue is the CEO of the LAM Foundation and the uh, leader behind all the activities that are conducted by the foundation for the benefit of the LAM community. Um, and who occasionally gets straddled with the task of moderating, which uh, really is just a nice way of saying that she needs to make sure that the three of us don't go off the rails. Uh, uh, on to you, Sue. Thank you, Nishant. I think everyone would be appreciative when the three of you uh, go off the rails, as you say. Um, it's my honor to share the Zoom screen uh, this evening with our three distinguished panelists, uh, and also to moderate this session about LAM science. Uh, I want to begin by thanking everyone who submitted questions in advance. We had an impressive number of emails, and by uh, your early submission, we were able to consolidate and organize them, and we're going to do uh, our very our level best to answer every question before the evening concludes. 
Uh, so moving into this next portion, I think we'll continue to uh, recognize the extent of, of Frank McCormick's, McCormick's influence um, by engaging with our panelists. Um, you all have been his colleagues for um, at least the, probably 26 of the 26 years of the foundation. Uh, and if not that, and certainly from the momentous research milestones as Nishant, Nishant just referenced um, in our understanding of LAM. Uh, Frank's vision and inclusive leadership style has in fact influenced an entire generation of scientists, including all three of you. Uh, his years spent building this organization and this research community um, were filled with many firsts. In, in fact, I think everything was a first and there was no map for him or for you. I actually found a quote uh, that I believe is descriptive of Frank and, and how that happened. And I want to read it as a lead into our first question for all three of you. Um, this is from Dr. Antonia Novello, who uh, was the first female and the first Hispanic to be um, Surgeon General of the United States. And she says, quote, I believe that fortitude is key. More than anything, be consistent. Go at it, go at it, go at it. When you succeed, don't forget the responsibility of making somebody else succeed with you. So here's our first question for our panelists. We're going to begin with uh, Lisa Hensky. What is your first memory of Frank McCormick and how did he influence your road to being here tonight? Thank you, Sue. I think everybody here is probably having this conversation with themselves. When did I first meet Frank? And for me, that first meeting is so, so clear. It was in 1998, sitting at my desk in my lab, talking to Frank on the phone about the possible connections between tuberous sclerosis and LAM. And I had honestly never heard of LAM. And that phone call changed the course of my professional career and also personally um, led to just such so many truly, truly rewarding experiences. Frank has been my scientific mentor, my career mentor, my go-to for all kinds of questions and a very trusted friend and advisor. But I think for me, the first time I met Frank depends on which Frank we're talking about. So that Frank is the, that I met in 1998 is the scientifically curious Frank, the one who asks the right questions, who sees connections between different fields um, and that has benefited everybody. But there are two other Franks that I got to know later. Um, the second one is the courageous Frank, the Frank who started a clinical trial, the Miles trial, um, a randomized trial in a rare disease. It's, it's tremendously courageous to do something like that. And in fact, just starting a foundation to try to find a treatment for a disease that no one had heard of more or less also tremendously courageous. And then lastly, there's the compassionate Frank who everyone has been talking about, the one who is so committed to each and every one of us who asks about my family as well as about my science, who answers every text message and email and phone call. So I think there, those three sides to Frank, um, people spoke about it so beautifully, um, curiosity, courage and compassion, those three C's, curiosity, courage and compassion are really the things that I love so much about Frank. Um, and I think also the keys to his incredible success for this community um, in the past, in the present and in the future. I also think Frank might need less sleep than most other people because I don't know how he does everything that he does. So thank you, Frank. And I look forward to hearing more questions about the science. Thank you, Lisa. And Vera, how about you? Um, it's about 20 years since uh, my career took a big turn and I gained this big family of the patients, physicians, scientists, thanks to Frank. 
about 20 years ago, I was about to start my research career and I was looking for meaningful life <laughs> in, in career. And then my mentor told me there is some rare disease called lymphangioleomyomatosis. And since I got my PhD, I thought like I need to find a disease which have very clear pathology and there is very little known. And I thought that could fulfill my life. And here's, uh, I wrote email to Frank that I uh, heard about lymphangioleomyomatosis and I told him that I would be interested in submitting proposal. And, of, and instead of having just email response, Frank called me, but just, you know, so my heart was jumping out because then you are young foreigner starting career. Here you have a phone call from established scientific director of the Lamb Foundation. That was very exciting. And he told me about Lisa, uh, discovery of TST2 gene uh, found in lamb cells. And then uh, we need next scientific step, which is um, happens to be, I was around that time. So Long story short, that was the beginning of long journey, which gave me the family. <laughs> thank you, Frank. And um, thank you for your openness to basic science, because basic science is a, you know, kind of weird path. <laughs> and often it take a courage and belief uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, confidence, like we could find a really cure. And that's why uh, we found the treatment and uh, hopefully in our lifetime, we could make a uh, forward advancement. About believing in science, and um, I appreciate Frank who make my career who what it is. Um, based on our preclinical study, Frank uh, uh, voted, give vote of confidence to help uh, to run PhD, initiate PhD first clinical trial, which is really <laughs> very unusual as I learned. So thank you, Frank, in your support, belief, and uh, uh, confidence that we could do. And I think uh, with this, uh, you stepping back and giving us, uh, I mean, giving Nishant and all community, uh, giving us uh, next, uh, a breath of hope that having you watching us a little bit from the distance here with Holly, <laughs> you could still manage us and direct us. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward for next 20, 25 years in the next turn of LAM Foundation and LAM Scientific Community, LAM Patients, who could, um, as a big family, we could move on and have new new steps in helping uh, each other, helping patients, which is, that's all the goal. So thank you, Frank. And by the way, when I was learning history in Soviet Union, we had a philosophical question. What is the role of one person in history? Is that, is that person has a role in the history? And obviously you uh, tell that yes, one person could change the world and you did change the world of science, uh, treatment and um, will help us to move forward to find the cure or at least step one more step forward to finding that. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Vera. It occurs to me that there are so many people beyond the panelists on this call tonight and in that video who have watched this history unfold. And it's truly extraordinary testament to uh, the cohesiveness and, and leadership that we've had. Nishant, you, you gave us your Dr. Google story. Did, did you have an additional uh, contribution to that question or shall we move to the next? I think we better move to the next so if to, to keep on time. <laughs> I can go on forever. All right, great. Um, so, well, we'll stay with you then, Nishant, since you are un unmuted. Um, so much has happened over the last 25 years, uh, and I think many people on the call are interested to know what's, what's happening more recently. So what do you see as the most important advancement in uh, the world of land research in the last five years? In the last five years, uh, you know, I think there are numerous uh, and uh, uh, I think you, Lisa and uh, Vera are going to uh, capture a lot of the major research highlights. So, so I'm gonna try to provide a slightly different perspective to this answer and this question. 
Uh, I think some of the most important advancements over the past five years uh, have been the rapidly expanding approvals of Serolimus, uh, which uh, now is available in uh, more than 40 countries across the world, uh, which has uh, meant that a lot more patients have uh, access uh, uh, to an effective therapy for LAM. Uh, the second has been the expansion of the LAM clinic network that has been briefly brought up on the video before, but you know, not only in the US, but also across the world, which has ensured that LAM patients get uh, high quality care. Uh, and this anecdotal experience that uh, it seems that the stories of delay in diagnosis uh, lasting years that a lot of people on this call, I think, are painfully familiar with, uh, they seem to be getting better over the uh, past five years. Uh, although clearly there is a lot of work to be done on this. Uh, and lastly, another thing that happened in the past five years was the patient benefit conference uh, that opened our eyes on you know, what, what is truly important to patients. So we can also start directing our energies on tackling issues that matter most to patients. So in short, I think in the past five years, I want to highlight the fact that a lot more LAM patients are getting diagnosed early, they're getting diagnosed in a more timely manner, and they are getting treated appropriately. Excellent, thank you. Lisa, how about your perspective on the last five years? And unmute. It's, it's, it's a really good thing that we have so many discoveries and advances that it's hard to even think about how to catalog them. But I would just highlight one, which is the single cell RNA sequencing of LAM cells, an initiative that actually was pushed forward by Frank that gives us basically a dictionary so that we can now really look at the cells and figure out LAM cells and all the cells that are around them and figure out what they're trying to tell us. And I sometimes look at that as another benchmark in our field where we can query the cells at that, at that level of detail. But there are many, many other things. I could talk for several hours about all the advances in just the last five years, which is pretty amazing. Well, I'm hoping we'll have the opportunity to delve into several of those tonight. Uh, many of the questions from the patients are exactly that. Vera, your thoughts? Uh, my thoughts are natural extension of Lisa's based on single cell, because I think uh, uh, Alice study, Frank study, Lisa's study, at least I will talk about Alice study. Then we analyze lamb lungs. Uh, the general impression is uh, for us is that it's really paradigm shifting. If we, uh, in the last 20 years, we fought about LAM cell and we talk about LAM cell and we wanna treat LAM cell. But now based on single cell analysis, we could see that LAM cell uh, hijack transcriptome on all other cell of lungs. So it's not like uh, LAM cells, it's not a just LAM cell disease, it's a whole lung disease. So it's affects whole lung and whole different cell types. And that opened new doors for uh, finding treatments and new approaches, how we could treat this disease. So I would say, um, I'm not MD, but I would say holistic approach in finding, making discovery in lungs, in limb lungs. It's not just the limb cells, it's all other cells. That's a community of cells which talk to each other and make all this big damage. So how we could manipulate that. We, we open whole new world of opportunity to target and, and manage for future. We have work for the next 20, 25 years to, do, to see how we could discover how to manage all other cell types in the lungs besides LAM cell. So we have a, a dictionary, if you will, of uh, to help us interpret what the what's going on inside the lung and what everybody's saying. Yeah, and learn their language because talk uh, cells are talking. So cells in lamb lungs, they talk differently than cells talks in the normal lungs. So that's what we have to learn their language and see how to understand that language and see how we could um, manage that. So you started to touch on the next question and we'll, we'll stay with you Vera and then go back to Lisa and Nishant is uh, what's next? So um, we're talking about 
what it would be to understand that language. What are you excited about going forward? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a futuristic person, so I always <laughs> jump in ahead of time. But uh, besides just having conversation and learning cell conversation and then the lungs, I think hearing what they're doing will help us to understand how we could um, how we could restore, I think the future goal would be, can we restore the damaged lungs? That's a very futuristic, but that's a question. It's my next dream in next five years. By learning how they talk, can we stop them, keep talking and, and <laughs> force them to talk normally so the lung could start going back at, at, and, uh, and restore their structure? So that's my dream in LAM to try to help the lungs to restore themselves because there is a potential at some specific, uh, specific point. And that would be my futuristic dream in five years to pursue. Wow, that's an incredible dream. Lisa, I see you're unmuted. I, I really believe that we're going to be learning about the white blood cells or the immune system in lamb in a way that will transform how we think about the disease and also how we treat the disease. And this is work, again, that Vera has, has led and others that are telling us what happens to the white blood cells when the lamb cells come into the lung. And we think the white blood cells are actually helping the lamb cells grow and destroy the lungs. And the flip side of that is we think that we could so-called target or turn those white blood cells into cells that would recognize and destroy the lamb cells. And this is something that uh, many of you may know that I'm an oncologist. This is something that has transformed the care of many different types of cancer. And we think it might also be a way to transform the care of women who have lamb. And I, just to emphasize this really amazing connection between the lamb community and the lamb science, this was a suggestion that um, a member of our lamb community, Barb Hare, made to me maybe seven years ago that maybe we could use the white blood cells to help control lamb. And I think that's going to be a reality. So thank you, Barb. Barb is on the call. Thank you, Barb. Excellent. Um, Nishant, do you have uh, ad additional thoughts about uh, other areas that you're excited about looking forward? I think they've already been well covered. I, I, I want to second uh, the excitement and the optimism that has been brought about by uh, single cell RNA sequencing, which is uh, just vastly expanding uh, our understanding of LAM. And I think uh, uh, really for the first time has given us hope that we will better understand the cell of origin, uh, which has just been a, a, a critical missing piece. Uh, in LAM. And that with that comes the hope for uh, better biomarkers and more targeted treatments. And that, that's what I'm optimistic about. Excellent. And we've talked about the um, research, what we're excited about in that arena. On the clinical front, uh, either Lisa or Nishant, are there things that you're particularly excited about in the next five years on the clinical side? Is it okay if I go first, Nishant? Sure, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, yeah, we, I mean, Nishant already mentioned this. We, we urgently need better biomarkers. And a biomarker means something that could tell us whether LAM is getting better or worse. Right now, we really can't tell that very precisely. If your kidney function is getting better or worse, we do a blood test called a creatinine. And we know quite precisely whether your kidney function has gotten worse. For LAM, we don't really have a measurement like that. And we, we desperately need one because that would allow us to do clinical trials so much more efficiently. We would know much sooner if a new treatment was working or not. So I, I, we are working on that on many fronts and I, I really feel optimistic that we're going to find it. It hasn't been easy. If it had been easy, we would have found it a long time ago, but we have really great people, actually many of whom Frank has brought into our, our midst um, to help us find that, that biomarker, something that will really tell us about the severity of LAM and its trajectory. Is it getting better or worse that 
would both of course be super helpful for women just trying to make decisions about their own land, but on a bigger scale would let us do clinical trials so much faster. PFT is less than ideal. Yes. Except for the fact that that's uh, our way of torturing patients. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't agree more uh, with what Lisa said. I think, you know, a, a better way to uh, quantify LAM, quantify the progression of LAM, assess treatment uh, responses, uh, whether by blood-based biomarkers or imaging-based biomarkers, they, they are uh, really important for the field. Um, we talk about a lamb specific PET scan that can measure the total body lamb cell burden. That, that, is, uh, that just uh, can revolutionize how we uh, design our trials. Uh, on, a, on a slightly different front, something else I'm excited about from a clinical side and uh, that I think we need to think about for the future is uh, uh, to uh, try to really uh, harmonize uh, and globalize the LAM patient community uh, into a more uh, connected community. And uh, the and this is some of these are lessons that we have learned uh, during the pandemic. Uh, there is this is a, a very complex uh, discussion, a complex uh, topic. But I, uh, you know, since we are talking about dreams from a clinical slash patient side. Uh, that would be something that I'd like to work towards is uh, how can we connect the community together uh, and uh, allow more patients to contribute data inside uh, uh, valuable information uh, together in one connected resource. Yeah, certainly in a rare disease community, um, more, more patients, more power, right? And so many Peers, again, encouraged by Frank and early leadership to make connections across the globe uh, with our many of our worldwide land patient coalition partners and clinic directors are, are on the call tonight. Uh, so that it is indeed um, very, uh, very exciting. So sometimes when I'm a panelist, I will sit and hope that somebody asks me a question, the question that I have an answer that I want to say. Um, and uh, I just wanted to put that out to our panelists. Is, is there any, anything you specifically would like to contribute or answer that I may not have in the form of a question right now? I have one. Please do, um, please go ahead. I wish that you had asked us, why are we so excited to be working with Nishant? And um, uh, many of us have known Nishant for a long time. He has um, brought such, um, wonderful scientific insights and clinical insights and guidance to our community. He has already been running the, um, the monthly LAM clinic network calls really expertly, bringing in a lot of people and new ideas. And um, I just think there's, there's just such optimism and uh, excitement about working with Nishant, who's going to build his sense of humor, hopefully, to be just like Frank's. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Vera, are you about to say something? Yes, I would like to say uh, I'm excited uh, to work with Nishant and uh, all group of scientists uh, and uh, having Nishant uh, input on science and uh, how we could advance our basic and translational science and would love to. Um, it's exciting to have new chapter. And for my part, I would echo that as uh, your partner at, on the Lamb Foundation side of things. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. I feel like you just stepped right up to the deep end and jumped in. Um, and I'm glad you're a strong swimmer. Um, you, you, know, uh, you know so much about this community and the science and the, um, the medical side and the foundation already. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure and I'm really excited about all the, all the ideas we have going forward. So can I interject for just one second? Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Fun fact, I have no idea how to swim. <laughs> uh, 
the uh, second thing for uh, it, it just a, a first a thank you and uh, uh, b is uh, you won't get it uh, get by that easy everyone by just saying we will uh, put this on nishant it's uh, I, i'm going to put this right back on you and say i'm going to be hounding you forever uh, for uh, for guidance for help for collaboration uh, really you are the folks that that uh, we look up to and and uh, we need your guidance every step of the way uh and regarding the sense of humor i uh, i hope i can uh, match frank's sense but uh if if i even come close it will be with more uh up to date hollywood references <laughs> fair enough all right very good well we have a long list of excellent questions from members of our lamb community that i will um certainly do my best to direct if it's appropriate for one of our panelists and please just um, give me a nod or unmute yourself if you'd like to also add to to that particular question so our, our first question i'm going to direct to vera because your name is in the question uh, and it says i'm interested in vera's research on the wnt pathway as a potential treatment for lamb I know that there are many drugs already on the market that interrupt this pathway, like Sulindac, for example. Um, are there any partnerships happening with drug companies to study this um, or potential studies in general in the near future? Wow, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Wind pathway is very complex. And uh, we just stumble on that uh, in uh, our recent study in our animal model showing that wind pathway is uh, working together with uh, mTOR pathway in uh, changing structure of the lungs. But um, I think if Jilly could be unmuted, he, she would be an expert uh, who I rely in that network and expertise. So I think question is about can we do drugs and uh, Potentially, yes. In the big picture, yes, but it's very complicated. Wind pathway is very important. It's very hard to find target, but um, too many targets and many drugs not yet in a clinical in a clinical trial, but none of them brought to the uh, you know phase three and four. So it's complicated as as <laughs> not very good answer, but that's the truth. So, but we're we have new opportunity how we could maybe manipulate two pathways and uh, have some combinational therapy as a as a future goal. Uh, we don't work yet with any companies, but that's the beginning. We're just at the very very beginning of exploring how those pathways talk, and maybe uh, we could find some. Um, some uh, targeting there, combinational potentially. And I'm very lucky to work with Jill Evans, who is here on my team, uh, who is expert in clinical uh, drug development. So um, I'm hopeful that we may find some some future uh, combination. Can I just say a couple of words? Yes, you know, Jill it's, it's, it's very hard to keep Jill Evans quiet, but... Uh, Thank first of all, I'd like first of all, I'd like to say I am so so happy that Nishant is going to take the banner from uh, Frank. He can probably run a little bit faster than Frank, <laughs> but, um, and I only say that because I love Frank and Holly, and so I can tease just a little bit. But I have the hugest uh, uh, admiration for you, Nishant. I think you know that. I often give you hugs, <laughs> which I don't know if you like or not, but I often do. Um, and so I'll stop, I'll stop embarrassing Nisha, but uh, the WINT pathway, the WNT pathway is very exciting. There are quite a lot of drugs on the market, which non-selectively, so not specifically on that pathway, but they do have some inhibition of that pathway. I think what the research community, including Vera's lab, which I'm so lucky to be working in, we really would like to have selective very clean therapy that might dampen that pathway, not necessarily shut it right down, but dampen it so that it can be beneficial along with serolimus. If it was additive with serolimus, that would be the very best thing. But if I just may say to all the lamb ladies and families, researchers and clinicians, I am so delighted to be part of your community. I'm not trying to take over Sue, but I just want to say 
Thank you, Jill. This has been a passion in my life for the last 20 years since I got involved by Bronwyn Gray in New Zealand. And, and I got a fax, not an email, because the fax 20 years ago, I didn't get an email, but I phoned Bronwyn straight away and said, I, I'm a asthma person. I know Singular, I helped develop Singular, but I will work on LAM. And it's been one of my great, great pleasures. Other than my three partners. It's our privilege to have you on our board and in our research network. Thank you, Jilly. So that went pathway question comes from Barb Hare. So perhaps in five or seven years, we'll be looking back and saying, Barb asked us this question and now it holds real potential. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Uh, another uh, different question uh, with about three questions wrapped into it as most of these are. Uh, this one reads, we consider LAM a lung disease and damage to the lungs is obviously of paramount concern. To what extent is LAM a lymphatic disorder? Is it also an immune disorder? And what do we know about the function of the immune system of women with LAM relative to the general population? And I'm going to let one of you volunteer for that one. Or three. Uh -huh. Sure, I'll, I can start, but I think I'm going to punt the second half of this to Lisa and Vera. So the short answer is uh, yes. Uh, that uh, <laughs> Yes, LAM is a lymphatic disorder. Yes, LAM is an immune disorder. Uh, and yes, the uh, effects of LAM uh, extend beyond the lungs uh, and can really have multi-system effects. Uh, uh, just expanding on that a little bit, we know that uh, LAM cells... Um, uh, secrete factors that allow the lymph vessels to uh, provide easy access for the lamp cells to go from one place to the next. Uh, and in a uh, in a subset, you know, roughly about 20% of the patients with sporadic lamp, they can have lymphatic complications where uh, the lymph or the chyle or the lymphatic fluid uh, can uh, start getting accumulated in places where it doesn't belong. So you can have fluid accumulation in your uh, belly or around your lungs. Uh, so, so these are just some clinical observations that, that tell us that LAM uh, is, a, uh, is a disease that involves the lymphatic system. Um, and regarding the immune system, you know, the past few years uh, have really shown us uh, how uh, LAM cells are uh, masters at uh, evading uh, our immune system's detection that allows them to uh, grow unchecked. And, and this is really work that has uh, been led by uh, Vera and Lisa. And so I think I'm gonna ask them to comment on the immune function aspect of it. You know, I love the analogy that Vera used earlier about the different cells in the lamb lung having conversations with each other and basically helping each other along to remodel the lungs in lamb. That's that's the heart of this disease really are these conversations between different cell types, the lymphatics and the immune cells and the lamb cells and other cells in the lung. So we're now just beginning to sort out the tone of that conversation. What are these different cells telling each other? And what we, we think is happening is that the immune cells are cooperating with the lamb cells and allowing those lamb cells to shield themselves, put a coat of armor around them, basically, to prevent them from being destroyed by the immune system. And the same thing is happening with the lymphatics. The lymphatics are talking to the lamb cells, and then the lymphatics are talking to other cells. So to understand lamb, we really have to understand all those different conversations. And whoever asked that question, that you're, you're at the heart of it. That we can't just we can't just look at one cell type. We have to look at all these cell types in the lung as a basically a community and a whole bunch of conversations that are going in different directions. Thank you, Lisa. Vera. Yeah, I could add. Um, of course, I agree with Nishant and Lisa. It's a, such an insightful uh, conversation. Just uh, um, I would like to add that we there is a group of researchers, which is we part of Lisa and I, uh, which is really working really very intense, and including Caroline Lepole, who is trying to develop immunotherapy for them. And that would be uh, 
future for some patients maybe. So there is an effort and there is a dedicated uh, uh, enthusiastic work going on to find out how we could do Im use immunotherapy as an approach for patients. For some patients, I would like to point out because probably some therapy works for others. Uh, and um, here at being at Penn, there is a lot uh, of immunotherapy, very strong uh, center. So there is a great interest, great experience, but it's like any therapy, there is no, that's a hard path to make sure it's safe. It's safe for patients and uh, we are uh, research and clinicians working on that. So there is a hope. So in, in listening to the conversation, it's, it's a little bit like how it started with the lamb cells were always the focus and the problem. But what we're hearing now is that the lamb cells are getting other cells to do things uh, and, and uh, behave badly, if you will, uh, to, to create this additional damage, depending on which part of the, of, of the body they're in. Is that true? Is that the dictionary and the translation, right? Great job, Sue. You've got yeah. it all figured out. But no, just, just interpreting, uh, there, was a, there was a presentation that Frank gave years ago that is still one of my favorites where he compared lamb cells to terrorists. Um, and I, I think it was a slightly different uh, uh, use of that word, but it, it certainly feels like that wherever they travel to, they, they create havoc, uh, if you will. Very good questions. Um, so uh, here's one on the, um, from a Kathy down in Texas related to DLCO and whether there's uh, any plans or any ongoing scientific study to find therapy that will help with uh, declining DLCO specific. And, uh, Lisa, is that one you could? Maybe? That's a Nishant. That's a Nishant, okay. Our pulmonologist. Yes. Man, I like how that came to me. And uh, so, uh, you know, first, uh, uh, and just a little bit about DLCO. I think uh, most people on the in the audience know what diffusion capacity is, but in case there are some uh, patients who are newly diagnosed or not familiar with it, that's a subset of a lung function test, which is trying to measure how much oxygen goes in from your lungs to your blood. Uh, and the primary measure that we are so far using uh, and to measure efficacy of uh, drugs in LAM is uh, FEV1, which is uh, measuring how much air can you blow out in the first one second. Uh, so DLCO is a slightly different measurement. Uh, uh, there are uh, some issues with DLCO as a, as a measurement and that it has a wide normal range. It is uh, affected by things outside the lungs, for example, your hemoglobin, whether you're on oxygen or not. Uh, and so, so those are some of the reasons why diffusion capacity doesn't uh, often get to be the starting endpoint. Regardless, I think the gist of this question is uh, that there are uh, patients who may have continued progression or patients who, uh, you know, serolimus may have slowed disease progression but not have completely halted disease progression to where the declining DLCO may be suggesting that there is this is a measure of uh, worsening disease progression. Uh, so we really, in terms of answering this question, uh, we really don't need to think of this as a therapy that can help uh, declining DLCO. We really need to think about it in terms of taking to the basic crux of that uh, we need to find new therapies that lead to remission. The uh, thought being, the hope being, the belief being that if you can find a remission inducing therapy, uh, that there will not be a progressive decline in diffusion capacity. Sue, so you're muted. Sue, so. you're muted, Sue. So. Had to happen. Um. I was saying that that's been a, uh, the, the remission piece is, you know, serolimus slows things down, but it doesn't fully take uh, you know, the, the disease into remission. Is there another um, drug or, or way that we could do that, which has been ongoing? Uh, and that actually leads into another 
group of questions about our recent clinical trials that have been underway. And uh, I think all three of you have been a part of these people asking for updates uh, specific to resveratrol and the statin uh, trial. And I think there was one other, I'll find that note while um, maybe Nishant, you could talk a little bit about the result trial and where that is. Yeah, I think that answer is uh, essentially going to be an apology for the audience that, uh, you know, the uh, just to backtrack, the result trial was a, a phase two trial where uh, we gave escalating doses of resveratrol uh, to lamb patients who were on a stable dose of serolimus. Uh, we have fully recruited and finished uh, the study that happened in fall of 2020, so about uh, six or seven months from now. And uh, I know a lot of patients, uh, some who participated in the trial and others uh, want to know the results. Uh, I, I have a slight excuse in the form of COVID that I will gladly abuse uh, in the delay in getting the results out. But that is, uh, I, we have only partially looked at the results. We haven't completely analyzed them. That is high on my list to finish on the, over the next two or three months. So I, I promise I will get back to the LAMP community with the results. I, I don't have anything specific uh, right at this time. All right, thank you for that. Uh Vera, how about uh, related to statins? So we, uh, thanks to the LAM Foundation and uh, Frank and uh, LAM Foundation support, we completed the study to test safety of simvastatin in patients uh, who are on their apomyosin and stable lung function. So our study was published uh, last year. And the uh, conclusion of the study that is that simvastatin is safe uh, to use with combination with rapamycin. That was the major, oh, that was the goal and that was the conclusion. So um, what's the next steps? That's something for us to think and decide, but at least the first, uh, first stage about safety of the drug and combination is concluded and supportive that it's, um, it's uh, safe. Excellent. Thank you, good progress. Uh, there was a, another clinical trial, um, I believe involving uh, Gleevec and uh, that was conducted in New York and South Carolina. I don't know if anyone on of the panel has any updates on that trial. Maybe Nishant, no. <clears throat> yeah, no, sorry. I don't know the, the current status of the study or the results. Uh, we can try to find out and, and, and get back to the uh, person who asked the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. We can do that. Um, any other trial results that you may want to, to comment on? Yeah, any of you? I, I think there's an important parameter of the trials that we're doing right now to have another true efficacy trial to show that something is better than rapamycin, for example. We really need those biomarkers. We, we, can't, we can't prove anything is better than rapamycin, in my mind, with our current outcomes, which are lung function. So it's another reason why we really need to push forward with the biomarkers. We have, as Vera was saying, we know now that, that the statins are safe. We know that resveratrol is likely to be safe. We don't know, Nishant hasn't finished analyzing that yet, but the, the pivotal trials like the MILES trial require a, you know, a tighter endpoint than we currently can achieve. Yeah, and if I may add, Lisa, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. I, I wanted to bring up a similar uh, theme regarding trials is that, uh, you know, that also goes back to the uh, comment I made about uh, more of a connected global community is that uh, if you think about uh, the new treatment being something that needs to be added on top of serolimus, uh, it is very much likely that the effect size of that treatment uh, will not be as large as the effect size of serolimus was, uh, which by definition means we will need a much larger number of patients for such a trial, uh, which may or may not be feasible uh, uh, to do in uh, in just United States. So that's another reason, in addition to the better biomarkers and better surrogate endpoints, we need to uh, really think about a more global connected community that can help us achieve that goal. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Absolutely. And the maybe it's a, we've talked about this, a, a byproduct of, of this last year of Zoom calls and COVID, but we certainly have seen a much greater participation across borders and even across languages. Um, and maybe that will continue into the future and help us with that goal, uh, Nishant. Um, here's a question, I think back to Nishant again, I think this is an area on which you've been focusing. Is there any kind of predictable progression of LAM at any stage of the disease? Uh, can I, I, I wish that someday our audience starts asking easy questions. <laughs> Um, uh, I think this question is uh, uh, another way of uh, referring to the natural history of LAM or what do we know about the natural history of LAM or are there any different phenotypes within LAM? Um, or I think, Susie, you said this once, right? Is my LAM the same as your LAM? Uh, and, and I think that's that's really the heart of where this question is, um, um, is going to. Um, the you know it is predictable in the sense that uh, on average, uh, if left unchecked, that majority of the patients will have disease progression over time. Uh, but it is uh, unpredictable in that the pace at which different patients progress over time is very different between one individual from another. Uh, some other somewhat predictable things we know are that. In general, premenopausal women with LAM tend to decline faster than postmenopausal women with LAM. Um, also, in terms of phenotyping, you know, there's, there seems to be uh, a couple different clusters where there is a, a cluster of more uh, younger women, uh, perhaps in the 20s and early 30s, who tend to present more with pneumothoraces. And then perhaps there is a separate cluster of women who present a bit later in life um, who uh, present more with shortness of breath and and don't tend to have very many pneumothoraces. So those are uh, just some other uh, couple of examples where we can uh, start to phenotype or subgroup uh, LAM patients. But, but this really is, is an area that also needs uh, better understanding. And, and this variability and unpredictability also highlights from the uh, for a practical standpoint for patients is why we uh, stress upon uh, really close monitoring uh, at individual level. So we can track individual patients' trajectories and use that as a control rather than comparing them with other uh, LAM patients. So there's a conversation going on in the chat and it um, kind of pulls together the last three questions. And I'd, I'd like to turn it into a, a new question for the three of you. So we've talked about the need for more patients across uh, borders to participate in trials, um, the, the need for understanding the longitudinal history of LAM. And what's been put forth is, is there a way for all of us to release our medical records to a central site for all researchers to look at all the data and all the trends? Um, and maybe that's a dream, um, but what might that mean in a rare disease community? And what's the likelihood of that, um, even in, even domestically, um, of that happening? It's my experience has been that every woman with LAM that I've met has said, whatever data I can share with you, I'd love for you to use it. Um, but they have to keep consenting and reconsenting. Does anyone have any, anything they want to expound on related to that? I think that the quality of the data that we can get right now is not, it comes down to pulmonary function tests versus this, um, in our future, a, a true biomarker that tells us about the activity of the disease. So I, I, I think it's great to share information and the LAM community has been so amazing at doing this already and we should do it to the maximum amount, but I'm not sure that's going to get us what we need, which is this biomarker or set of biomarkers that both would tell any individual woman how active her LAM is and how likely it is to progress over the next two years or five years or 10 years, but also tell us in the clinical trial setting, how many patients do we need to answer this question definitively in the shortest possible time? 
So I don't think that the, the information we can gather right now is, is enough. We need those biomarkers. Um, I agree with Lisa, absolutely. But uh, being a futuristic person, I like the suggestions made by Barb, I think about artificial intelligence. If all the data is deposited and artificial intelligence will analyze that and try to find the pattern, I think I'm all for that if we could do it. Yeah, and I, I'm going to uh, say a yes and a no uh, to this uh, simultaneously, because uh, I, I think it depends on, on what question we are trying to answer. Uh, if we are trying to answer the question that Lisa has posed about, can we use this patient driven patient collected data to uh, devise a new uh, imaging biomarker, uh, that is probably not the right uh, way or avenue to, to do so. Uh, but there are uh, meaningful questions that could be answered this way. For example, uh, if we, if the primary question is, can we assess long-term side effect profile of serolimus? Uh, right, that is most of that is data that is primarily derived by simply us asking the patients this question about, have you had any of the following side effects? Uh, so we are really using patient-derived data to try to answer that question. Uh, so, so, so some such endeavor could help answer that question. Another way this exercise might be helpful is if the primary aim for you is to identify uh, where the LAMP patients are with certain key characteristics that you need to enroll. Uh, uh, to, uh, and so I think we have used this before, a word before, but uh, think of this as a, as a census, if you will, rather than uh, uh, at some complex database. So, so you know, I, 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 so, so no, uh, from the prospect of having a very uh, a strict uh, controlled trial, but yes, in the sense that you could still gather useful information that has downstream benefits. Very good. So just to, to step back to the biomarker uh, piece, which seems vitally important is, um, where, what are the next steps with that? Or um, how would, what's, what's your optimism in, uh, in the next, you know, again, five to 10 years? What's, what the question in the, in the chat is, where are we? Or how would you describe that, where we are? Well, I would say that we are making progress on many fronts and that spans from studies done in mice right now that are not yet ready to move to humans, to early studies with the PET imaging, as Nishant mentioned a few minutes ago. PET imaging is a way to look using a scan, a total body scan at any place in the body that's active using a particular molecule. So the PET scans that we currently use in oncology are often looking at glucose, but we can modify that to make it more specific for LAM. So we have everything from studies in mice to studies in humans to anytime you donate a blood sample for any LAM research, that's another way you can contribute to biomarker studies. Many people are looking at different factors in the blood to try to figure out if there's something else there besides VEGFD or in addition to VEGFD that we could use. And I would say that one really great way to support all of this research is to support the LAM Foundation in every way you can because most of this research um, ends up being, uh, it's, it's early research. It's not the kind of research that most other organizations like the NIH are likely to support. So we, we really need the LAM Foundation to be able to help make these initiatives move forward. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Vera? Yeah, I would like to add about uh, continuing discussion about biomarkers, uh, human tissue, I mean, LAM, uh, uh, lamb tissue, lamb blood from transplant is crucial for discovery and for identifying biomarkers. So of course, uh, I would like to really um, express my great deep gratitude to all lamb patients who would donate their lungs and provide tissue for all the research. We wouldn't be here without all the generosity and support of the patients. And the future biomarker or other discovery is not possible from um, your support and inspiration. Thank mm -hmm. you. It has been a meaningful program. There are typically less than 10 
lamb lung transplants in any given year. And uh, the lamb community has stepped up to make sure that most um, those are able to be harvested and, and distributed to our scientists and makes it makes a big difference. Um, so I would echo that. Thank you to the staff and the patients and the scientists who make that complicated process happen. Any other comments on, on biomarkers right now? Okay. So um, here's a question that uh, when we were preparing for Lamposium last, uh, last year, only been a year, um, we had uh, several research sessions talk, uh, that were geared to talk about the origin of LAM um, and some recent um, dis discoveries or hypotheses around that. And the question is, with that knowledge, wherever it ends up being, um, what might be, how would that affect the next steps or what is, what's the current thinking of the origin of LAM? Does anyone want to comment on that tonight? I think we could ask Frank. <laughs> Emeritus. Uh, well, Sue, this is where you have to uh, point and say, you're up. <laughs> okay. Just kidding. Uh, no, it's, uh, I, I think all, all three of us should, uh, 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 should weigh in um, uh, on this. Uh, there is, I think the question is rightly uh, emphasized that uh, knowing the cell of origin is, is critical in LAM. That has been a key missing piece that, that really has confounded us for, uh, for decades. Uh, and, and knowing the cell of origin is important because then you, you know, that's a level of understanding for the disease that we have never had before that opens up avenues for targeted therapies that even opens up uh, avenues for possible preventative strategies, you know, and, and the particular example there would be, uh, especially if you look at the patients with DSC who have not yet uh, developed LAM. Uh, and in terms of uh, specifically where we are going with it, I think the optimism that all three of us have already shared uh, previously in the talk stems from the use of advanced technologies such as single cell RNA sequencing to allow us to get closer to answering the cell of origin question. Uh, we are gathering more data about it. The group at Cincinnati has um, published data that suggests that uh, uterus might be a potential leading candidate, but there are, uh, you know, that, that needs to be further validated. Uh, and I, I'm curious to, uh, I know both Vera and Lisa have uh, made uh, significant progress on the uh, single cell RNA front as well, trying to decipher the same question and be interesting to hear uh, their thoughts on this as well. I think we have Frank now, so we want to hear his opinion. I was, I'm sorry, I was having trouble unmuting and I seem to be fading the black here, which might be a metaphor for something, <laughs> but um, the, um, I think the biggest advantage of knowing the cell of origin is to be able to build a better animal model because as it stands now, the human is the only uh, model that can really prove anything in lamb. And that's obviously not uh, an optimal place to start. We like to try things in animals first, but we, we simply don't have adequate models. Uh, and with knowledge of the cell of origin, we could build a better animal model. Um, so I, I think that's, that's one of the great hopes for the future is that research will reveal where, where lamb cells come from. Excellent. Thank you. We have a, we have a lot of, I think we can work on our strategic plan just based on all the great questions that have, have uh, come out uh, here tonight. So I don't think that we could get through an evening with um, the, this population without asking a couple of questions about COVID uh, and lamb, lamb patients facing the challenges of the pandemic. Nishant, you're smiling. I did give you a heads up um, about this. And of course, our two other panelists are welcome to, to help, but I'm going to direct these to you. And uh, 
I don't know if you, there's so many questions, but if you could talk a little bit about the, the vaccines and some of the current publications about the vaccines available to and advice for women with Lyme. Uh, yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, you know, it, it would have felt odd if you had a whole hour pass without mentioning COVID. Uh, it's... Uh, but you know, for the right reasons, I think it is it is high on everyone's everyone's mind. Uh, the so as far as vaccines are concerned, there are three vaccines that have been granted emergency use authorization uh, by the FDA in U.S. There is the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Janssen. Uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are mRNA vaccines, and the Janssen vaccine is an inactivated viral vaccine. Uh, so essentially a different way of getting a portion of the spike protein in your cells, but at the end of the day, they, that's all they are uh, trying to do is to get your body to recognize a portion of the spike protein and form anti, um, immunity against it. So you're better prepared uh, uh, if faced with the real virus. The uh, Some of the questions we uh, hear are, and I'm just going to try to highlight the frequently asked questions is, uh, is one vaccine better than the other? Should I preferentially take one over the other? And that primarily stems from, um, you know, the reported efficacy of 90% in Pfizer and Moderna and the 60 to 70% in Janssen. And I, I just wanna say that these trials were done at different places at different timeframes. And these, vac these vaccines were not compared head to head. Uh, so you should not really uh, use them as head-to-head -head trials. My simplest recommendation is get the first vaccine that is available to you. Uh, and I'm looking at the chat box here. There is a question. I forgot to mention this. That's an omission on my part about AstraZeneca. And that's, real, and that's more for the international community. That's not approved in the U.S. But similar efficacy data uh, for uh, AstraZeneca as well. So the same rule applies uh, to all four of these vaccines. Um, the And by the way, we have uh, updated this information with a lot of these frequently asked questions on the LAM Foundation's uh, website. Uh, so highly encourage everyone to please take a look at the COVID-19 updates page on the foundation uh, where we have updated this and a lot of other information regarding the vaccines. A couple other quick questions patients ask is, uh, uh, can they still take the vaccine if they are taking serolimus? There are two layers to this question. One, uh, uh, can they get uh, the can they get COVID-19 from the vaccines because they are on serolimus? So none of these vaccines are live viruses. So there is no risk of getting COVID from these uh, vaccines. Uh, so please don't let that concern stop you. The other concern, which is more of an unanswered question is, uh, uh, will you mount the same degree of response if you're on serolimus uh, as compared to patients who are not on serolimus? And uh, the short answer to that question is that we don't know, uh, but our general belief is that some protection is better than no protection. So uh, whether you're on serolimus or not on serolimus, uh, please get vaccinated. Uh, a follow-up to this question that gets asked is, should you hold serolimus prior to taking uh, the vaccine? Uh, I don't know that there is an absolute right answer to that. Generally, we fear uh, progressive lung decline uh, in patients who uh, stop serolimus. So for most LAM patients, our suggestion is to keep serolimus on uh, and get vaccinated. The uh, a recent development has been a JAMA paper that more than a few patients have already reached out for. And I just wanted to take a minute for that, which is that that paper was done in a handful of uh, uh, patients post organ transplantation, where the investigators measured antibody response and found that the antibody response in those patients was uh, less than what was uh, previously reported uh, in the published studies. So a few things to keep in mind. One is that that, uh, that paper is a half-baked story as published in the sense that that response was measured after 
one dose of a two dose vaccination series. Uh, so we really need to know what the response is after both doses have been administered uh, because that's really the uh, comparison you're looking for, not what happens after one dose. Uh, Second is that uh, those patients were on a multitude of immune suppressive medications as opposed to the LAMP patients who generally are on just serolimus or for some patients just everolimus. So how much those findings translate to you is, is really an unknown. Uh, I've rambled on for over five minutes for this. I think that's enough for now. I, the last thing I'll say is that there is, uh, there is a uh, town hall that uh, the TS Alliance and the LAM Foundation are co-hosting. I think it's on April 20th at 6 p.m. with the uh, topic of COVID and vaccines. So uh, yeah, feel free to tune in there as well for a more detailed and in-depth discussion on this. Thank you, Nishant. Yes, uh, uh, and for that reminder, April 20th at 6 p.m. we'll have an entire hour devoted to uh, LAM, TSC, and, and COVID. Uh, with it with a great panel there. Okay. Um, we are working through our questions. And I think Lamb, we got that one. That's for... So um question maybe for our, our lamb clinic directors, and this is related to inhalers. So either uh, Lisa or probably Nishant. Um, are there any new developments regarding types of inhalers from which LAMP patients would most benefit? Um, and then building on that, is there any link uh, between the use of steroids or steroidal inhalers and increased risk of osteopenia or osteoporosis? Nishant. Okay, I'll, uh, so uh, first question regarding the type of inhalers, uh, you know, that generally translates to inhaled uh, bronchodilators, uh, typically short acting bronchodilators such as albuterol in the US or salbutamol uh, uh, primarily in Europe. Uh, we know that a subset of LAM patients, you know, somewhere between 20 to 25% uh, do derive uh, symptomatic benefit uh, from inhaled bronchodilators. Uh, and, and that is the subset where I think it is, uh, it is okay and perfectly safe to take these um, inhalers. Uh, regarding the question of osteopenia and osteoporosis, uh, you know, with the question mentioned steroids and inhaled steroids, which is a, a separate uh, uh, thing. If you are on steroids, where you're taking steroids in a pill form, that is uh, usually a significant uh, risk factor for osteoporosis or bone weakening, uh, putting you at risk for subsequent fractures. Uh, this, uh, this is a bit controversial when it comes to inhaled steroids. Uh, generally, the dose of inhaled steroids um, is not a very high risk situation for causing osteoporosis, although the literature on this is somewhat conflicted. Uh, certainly, if patients are taking high dose inhaled corticosteroids, there may be somewhat of an increased risk. Uh, we do also have to recognize, however, that there are other confounding factors in this, especially when we are talking about LAMP patients, because uh, if you are someone who has reduced mobility uh, because of lung disease, you're at risk of osteoporosis. Uh, because of that, uh, you uh, postmenopausal women are at risk of osteoporosis. So can we separate uh, these factors from uh, the risk posed by inhaled corticosteroids? Uh, probably not. Uh, but this does bring up a good point that, uh, that in general, we need to think a little more carefully about inhaler use in LAM. Uh, there is often a tendency to not think about uh, the adverse effects of um, inhalers uh, as much because we are more focused on the uh, on LAM or serolimus or other uh, things and this sort of uh, flies under the radar a little bit. Very good, thank you, appreciate that. Um, Lisa, anything you wanted to add to that answer? Okay, 
Very good. All right, so we are um, approaching the end and um, I want to make sure we give people time for a couple of our final questions and then maybe be thinking about some takeaways for each of you as our panelists from what you've heard tonight. And um, uh, we'll move on to the next question. And I'm asking this to each of you as uh, Land Foundation board members uh, and also as scientists. And this came up a little bit earlier already, so maybe we can, can build on that. But I think as patients are listening to this tonight, they're thinking, what are the most important things that I can do uh, as a patient, as a part of this community to help you uh, advance lamb research or help, help my lamb sisters? And this specifically uh, comes up to us all the time. So I, I'm drawing this question out a little bit so that you can think about your answer. But uh, if you would comment on what you think the most important things for lamb patients to do uh, would be, and I can start with Vera since you are unmuted. All right. Um, 20 years ago, I was in a minivan coming from on my first lamposium. And um, I was just pure basic scientist, <laughs> interested in problems. And I met lamp patients there on that minivan. And that was completely life-changing experience, which uh, could never, I think I'm lucky to know lamp patients. I'm lucky to serve them. <laughs> And uh, so I think be my inspiration and uh, of course your support, your, your uh, spirit, your courage, your uh, help, um, help us to move forward. We are part of your family. I'm lucky to be part of your family. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Lisa? I feel so uh, so strongly as does Vera and everybody about this connection that we have between the people doing lamb research and the women who are affected by lamb and their families. The questions that you're asking tonight, the fact that more than 200 of you are here, that's that's really what has been our successful secret all this time and it's going to be our success moving forward. This this partnership is just amazing and wonderful and powerful. Absolutely. Nishan? I think it's already been said very well by both uh, Lisa and Vera. I think my message to the patients is to uh, stay engaged, uh, ask questions. Uh, we may not know the answers to them, but, uh, but we will uh, try our uh, hardest to find an answer to them. And, uh, and a lot of research questions and research endeavors and directions uh, come from the questions that you raise. Uh, so, uh, so please continue to stay engaged and ask questions and contribute to the foundation. That um, staying engaged and it's, it's very specific yet very broad. We talk a lot about this, I think at, at a board level, at a scientific level and, and at the foundation, staying engaged can be just about anything. Uh, participating on these, these calls, um, sharing your ideas. Thank you again, Barb. Um, whether it's research oriented or fundraising oriented or simply reaching out to a lamb sister, um, attending a regional meeting with your hosted by your lamb liaisons, getting to know your lamb clinics, uh, clinic, clinic directors and understanding how they can support you and, and the women with lamb and their families in your area. It's uh, kind of that rule of getting involved and not assuming that things will move forward or that everyone's doing all they need to do. I don't need to get involved because um, that's what's gotten us to this point. So I would echo the specialness of this community and these, these panelists. Um, I would, I'll look back to the chat for a couple of additional questions and maybe turn to our, our three panelists for some closing remarks related to the things we heard about this evening. Um, anything you wanna summarize or, or share in a concluding comment? Um, we can start with Lisa this time. You know, I started out by talking about the things I love about Frank, his curiosity, his courage, and his compassion. 
I realize now that that how important those three traits are for all of us moving forward in every possible component of this organization and community. So curiosity, courage, and compassion, I think will put us in the right place. We may have a theme for our next symposium. Right. Uh, Vera? I would like to thank Frank for stepping up and uh, team up with Sue Burns. And I've seen she's here on the call. And it's amazing been a uh, journey uh, that he charted and uh, to uh, keep us all together and inspire, give goal and uh, meaning to our life, to my life. Thank you, Frank. Nishant. I'm gonna uh, echo what uh, Vera just said. I think it's only fitting that I, I, I try to uh, have my closing remarks basically uh, uh, mimicking what Frank uh, used to fin uh, finish a lot of these presentations with, which is um, to give the message of uh, hope, optimism, and to tell all the LAM patients on that, that the future of LAM is bright. Uh, and despite uh, the transition, I, I just want to reassure everyone that the central mission remains the same uh, to find ways to uh, improve uh, lives of LAM patients. And, and we will continue to pursue the same guiding principle that Frank has pursued for all these years that patients will be kept at the front and center of every decision we make. Excellent. Frank, I can still see you there in the dark and just wanted to offer a, a, the opportunity to say a few final words. Yeah, thanks. I we didn't we didn't know to get this this dark, but um, you know, first of all, I'd like to say that um, I feel a, a little uh, nervous about being charged with working on Nishant's sense of humor because he grew up in India. He doesn't have any of the important background for a lot of uh, the lamb humor that I have in mind. So I, I'm going to need some protected time, and I'll be sending in a proposal. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be watching for that. The second thing I wanted to say is that this is, I, I've been given way too much credit. I mean, the people on this call, Lisa Hensky discovered the genetic basis of lamb. Vera discovered the, uh, that tuberous sclerosis proteins were critical to lamb pathogenesis in the lung and, and laid, the, laid the course for trials. Nishant completed, without Nishant, we wouldn't have completed the, the guidelines that are now distributed around the world or completed the, the registry study that was done, started at the NIH in the 1990s and was just dropped. And he was the driving force behind all of those things and, and many others. Um, and Lisa Young, who I'm not sure if she's on the call, but she's responsible for the discovery of VEGFD and uh, there are many, many others who deserve uh, lots of credit for this. So I, 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 I'm humbled by what you said, but I don't accept the fact that I deserve all of what you said. And um, I think um, that we need to work on our design for trials in the future. The, the number of good ideas for drugs to try and LAM are just stacking up. And the ability to do trials in them is still very fraught. You know, it takes us too long to get a study up and going. There's too many regulatory hurdles. It costs too much money. Um, and, and we have to figure out a better way to do trials so that we can test these ideas. And, and biomarkers are absolutely key to that. You know, if we had a good biomarker that could tell us whether we're killing lamb cells, we might be able to get some early signals with just a few patients, maybe five or 10 patients, and we could design larger trials based on the best candidates. So uh, we need to think, be very thoughtful about designing trials into the future. And Nishant stole my closing line, which is that, uh, you know, the future is very bright for LAM. And, and I, I think that the, with Nishant's leadership and all of the scientific community that's been assembled and the patient community that supports them, uh, we can look forward to great successes in the future. Fantastic, thank you.
if you light that fire behind you, it might put a nice glow, <laughs> glow, glow behind you. It looks awfully nice out there. Uh, well, uh, this has been a, a terrific evening on so many levels, and I appreciate everyone who has joined us uh, in this in this celebration. As I think Shar mentioned earlier at the top of the hour, um, when we are together again for a research conference and lamposium, we will take the opportunity to, to celebrate um, all, all tonight again um, when we're together, as well as uh, all the new things that will be happening by that time. I uh, want to thank our three panelists, Drs. Krimskaya, Gupta, and Hensky for sharing their evening with us. Much gratitude to Charlene Dunn and uh, the hardworking staff at the Lamb Foundation and all that they did to pull tonight together. And a, an additional shout out to Dana and Dave Garrett of Trailhead Films for um, um, producing an extraordinary video. Um, there's a large group of volunteers who make all of this happen, I think, to, to Frank's point. Our board of directors, all of our clinic directors, care teams, and research coordinators, our LAM liaisons, um, members of our worldwide LAM patient coalition, and our dedicated network of research scientists and their research lab personnel. This is a, an extraordinary organization that stretches around the globe and, and across many fields of expertise. Uh, and to that, we owe everyone on the call a debt of gratitude uh, for making it happen and staying engaged. We will grab these questions out of the chat and make sure we uh, follow up as best we can. I'm going to look for a Char very quickly to see if I forgot any closing remarks before we end the evening. I think we're good. I just would like to, again, thank our panel and everyone involved and the staff in the back room making all the fancy Zoom tech happen tonight. Um, but anyway, thank you, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Hemsky, Vera, Frank, always a pleasure. And Sue, thank you for moderating. You're welcome. And to all of everyone in the, the questions were amazing. So huge shout out, as everyone has already said, to our community. And thank you for being here tonight. And a final thank you to Holly and Frank um, for uh, everything through the years. Um, uh, grateful. It's all been said. Have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.